OMG, as the kids say these days. I am uh, not in New York right now. I'm actually in uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico. <laughs> I'm gonna lower my mask right now, but I'm gonna be wearing it throughout the tour just so you guys can see me, hear me, whatever for now. But uh, I made it outside of New York. I'm gonna be giving you a tour today of Old San Juan. It's gonna be pretty amazing. Uh, but right now we're starting the tour. Well, before we start, real quick, please uh, hit the subscribe button. <laughs> you know, might as well. You're gonna like this tour anyway. Who are you kidding? And also hit the like button. Why not? You're gonna like this tour. Uh, I don't know any other people who are gonna be taking you through a walk of this entire town, so just do it. All right, save yourself the trouble. But uh, I'm Tom, we're gonna be walking through. I'm starting here at El Morro, San Felipe del Morro, which is actually a fort built here. It was started in 1539. How's that for old? And uh, you can see it here on the northwest coast, guarding the entrance to San Juan Bay, which is over here to the right. Uh, and we're gonna be walking from here, it's pretty amazing. This whole town is covered in walls, but uh, I don't know guys, I think we're kind of ready to start this tour. So uh, let's walk around, rock around uh, San Juan Puerto Rico. Oh, let's go, follow me. So you can see here to the left, you'll see, uh, you'll see the actual walls of the city go around the entire thing. There's only one opening, which we'll see a little later. Uh, and the reason is because they demolished it. In the late 1800s, the Spanish uh, demolished it to actually allow for the city to expand a little bit, allow for more entrance. You have a uh, famous uh, cemetery over here down to, the, to my left. Uh, pretty cool, right on the water. All of this here is the Atlantic Ocean. You can see all the Atlantic Ocean. The reason San Juan and, and Puerto Rico was so important to the Spanish was because this served as kind of the protection for the Spanish. Um, colonies here in the Caribbean. So the Spanish took this over in 1508. They, they took Puerto Rico. So what happened was Ponce de Leon, Juan Ponce de Leon, was sent here from Hispaniola by the Spanish to explore the area. So he, he basically scouted it out, settled here, made it basically Spanish territory, set up shop. They built a house here for him to live in, which you'll see here in a second. And then it became Spanish. Problem is he dies. He actually goes to Florida, which is where I'm from, believe it or not. He founds a uh, settlement there in St. Augustine and gets killed by a poison arrow, believe it or not. He ends up getting shot with an arrow and dies uh, in Cuba. Go figure. He was looking for the fountain of youth, they say, but that's been kind of disputed over time. Uh, but interesting story. We're going to see a little building here in a bit, and I'll tell you about that. But we're walking into the actual town now, which we'll, which we'll uh, show you, I guess, in B-roll. Oh, hey, how are you? My camera person is a is a, a local, a Puerto Rican local. Very nice. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna keep walking here, and to the right, you're gonna have El Bastion. And this is a really cool little cultural arts center. They play music there. They have like you know a bar. You can hang out. I was actually there the other night. I got to play. I got to see a little rehearsal of a of a group playing music there. It was pretty awesome. So all this area is kind of where the actual uh, city began. So the story goes, the Spanish took it over, had Puerto Rico uh, until 1898 when the Spanish-American War began. Uh, that was actually the United States really starting that. Uh, has a connection to New York, by the way, because the war started in 1898 when the USS Maine sunk and exploded off the coast of Cuba. The United States had been looking for a reason to invade Cuba before that because uh, sugar, the sugar companies in the United States wanted more control. They wanted to be in control, make more money, Sugar by that point had become the main crop in places like Cuba and in places like Puerto Rico. Before that, it was coffee. So we're gonna come over here. So the USS Maine explodes off the coast of Cuba. People like William Randolph Hearst, a very famous New Yorker. Uh, the Hearst building is still there right near Central Park. Push and push and push, kind of the way they did with the Iraq War. I don't know if you guys remember that, not to get too political. But the way they pushed with the Iraq War, it's okay. <laughs> The way they push with the Iraq War is the way they push with the Spanish-American War. And it becomes a, a war by, you know, 1898, what was called a splendid little war by military officials. Before that, I want to show you this. This is Museo Casablanca, White House Museum. This was built to house Ponce de Leon, but he never actually got to live here in the early 1500s because he died. So anyways, the Spanish-American War begins. People like Teddy Roosevelt were really pushing hard for that. In 1900, William McKinley is actually elected as president under the uh, kind of platform of expanding the United States and taking more territory and, and colonializing. Here you can see on this side here what it kind of looks like. Pretty cool. Pretty sick. Yeah, not so bad, right? It's hot as hell. I'm sweating my ass off. But they also say, I spoke to a local woman here named Norma. It's 
kind of like a interesting lady who walks around giving people like tours and she says that the caretaker here actually looks like uh, Ponce de Leon who uh, was looking for the Fountain of Youth so it's possible that he actually survived you know I'm gonna find that Fountain of Youth myself or maybe I already did a little background on Ponce de Leon he actually came to this island uh, on his second voyage he came to the Caribbean uh, on the second voyage of Christopher Columbus actually believe it or not he was actually on the same ship as Christopher Columbus when he came back in 1493 and that's when he kind of just stayed put in the Caribbean and then in 1508 came here to Puerto Rico but uh, that actual fortification, that little building, the Museo Casablanca, was built to protect against the rebels, uh, the Taino rebels, which is the uh, actual uh, Native American culture that was here before them. In fact, the word Boricua, you guys know that word, they, a lot of Puerto Ricans like to refer to themselves as Boricua or Borinquen. That actually is a word that derives from the Taino language. So we're heading down here. We're actually going by the Hospital de Callejón, in this hospital actually kind of the epicenter for the cats of San Juan. They actually kind of congregate around here and they hang out around here. Tons and tons of cats here and one of the reasons they say is because the Spanish brought them over to help kind of keep the place clean, killing mice and rats uh, and they actually say they can trace some of the DNA of these cats that are here to the cats that came over with the Spanish in the 1500s. Isn't that crazy? And there's actually a group here called uh, uh, save the Gato, I think it's called, and they uh, take care of them, they neuter them, do all that stuff, and they clip a little piece of their ear so you can tell which ones are actually taken care of by that group. How are we doing on light over there? <laughs> Phil couldn't come with me, just so you guys know. Aww. Phil's uh, Phil's at home. I had this vacation planned for a long time, and uh, it's weird, I guess right now I'm going to start putting on my mask because we're in the city and you're supposed to have it on. So I'm having it on, so chill out. Now here to the right, we're going to see this hotel, which is where I'm staying. It's called El Convento. We're starting to get close to San Juan Bautista, which is the actual cathedral here. It's the oldest one, where Ponce de Leon is buried. Oh, how cool is that? I guess I'm a little bit of a nerd for him because I'm from Florida and they always talk about him. And it's such a big deal over there. But this place actually used to be a convent. It was built as a convent in 1646. It's got kind of a cool history because it was built as a convent, then it was abandoned in the early 1900s. Then in the mid-1900s, there was a program called Operation Bootstrap that was implemented where basically the Puerto Rican government, as much as it could, basically eliminated corporate tax. So it just basically brought tons and tons of manufacturing jobs and basically boomed the Puerto Rican economy. And at that time, um, uh, one of the heirs to the Woolworth fortune uh, actually came and bought El Convento and turned it into a hotel. He only, owned, he only owned it for a few years, but he added a few floors, made it really cool, it's a really great thing. So now it's actually the oldest uh, historic hotel in the Americas, kind of cool. And that's where I'm staying, no big deal. Not like that big, big or that important or whatever, just kind of staying here. Cool. Let's go inside and check it out. Estoy aquí con Adrián, quien es el gerente de marketing para el convento. ¿Qué tal todo? We can definitely do this in English, by the way. Sí, pero ¿cómo vas a ver la gente que yo hablo español? <laughs> um, so, where are you from originally? San Juan, born and raised. What's your favorite part of working in such a historic hotel? There's a bit of history intertwined into every corner, a history that has to do with the island and how the island was developed and then how it became what it is today. Have any celebrities ever stayed here? Tons. Has uh, Bill Nye stayed here? No, I don't think so. Maybe before my time, but hey, Bill, if you're listening, come on down. Yeah, Bill, if you're listening, uh, love to have you on, as a guest on my show, even though you have nothing to do with New York or tourism. So what's your favorite thing about San Juan? The people. Definitely the people. They, they dance to a different beat. There's much more appreciation for the history of the island. I mean, this was the important part of the island for 300, 400 years. So this used to be an actual convent, right? Yes, it was till 1903. So where'd you guys put all the nuns? <laughs> the nuns are two blocks away near the governor's mansion and another convent. If you uh, misbehave or you're too loud in your room, does a nun come in and slap you with a ruler? <laughs> Why'd you choose to live in San Juan out of all places? In the States, I think you really see your grandparents and cousins once or twice a year. Here, I would see them weekly, daily, sometimes I went to school with them. We're too close for comfort, but it's comforting. So this is a really beautiful hotel and I would love to work here. Uh, is it okay if I apply to be like a bartender or something? I have uh, my headshot. Yeah, we're full, unfortunately, but I'll let you know if anything comes up. 
Okay. So we're gonna keep walking through. Here in front, you're gonna see a little plaza and then San Juan del Bautista, which is St. John the Baptist. That's where Ponce de Leon is buried. And that's it right there. Show you some shots inside here. Pretty, pretty sick. And now we're gonna take it right here. This whole area was built to protect basically the Spanish interests in the Caribbean. Now this is basically a portal into the Caribbean Sea. Um, so anyone who's got to get through and go through all the riches and all that stuff has got to kind of pretty much come through here. <clears throat> so that fort that we, we just saw was attacked a lot. Uh, maybe you maybe heard of Sir Francis Drake. He led an attack there, the Dutch, the British, everyone was always trying to attack it. You can see also too though, all the influences of that Spanish colonial architecture still here, all the colors. The colors have always been a very important part of it. In fact, that was the way that people identified where you lived. You say, I live on the, in the blank colored house, the light green house on a different street. That's kind of the way that people told you how to get to where you're going. Now up here, you're gonna see at the end of this block, uh, one of the, the gates, Las Puertas de San Juan. Yeah, it's no big deal. Uh, I know that accent's pretty, pretty nice, but uh, let's, let's move on. I don't want to focus on that too much. But there's seven of these gates, and they're actually like the doors within which you would go in, and some of these walls are up to 20 feet wide. And the idea was to protect the, the, actual, uh, you know, the actual colony. But you can see one right here. And then over here to the left, you have Fortaleza. La Fortaleza is pretty much the governor's mansion. It was actually built as kind of a fort, a stronghold, but now today is actually the governor's mansion where the governor of San Juan lives. The governor is actually Wanda Vasquez Garcet. But an interesting story about her, we can't go through there, I don't think, because uh, they closed it off right now for protection purposes. Last year, there was a man named Rosello who was the governor. Pretty crazy. And there was an expose on him. And what happened was they uncovered some text messages, a text message chain between him and some of his officials that revealed how homophobic, how how sexist they were and it created a huge uproar people got extremely upset lots of protests and now you can see san juan bay in fact you can take a ferry across this bay and go visit the bacardi factory pretty cool but there was actually a huge protest a huge uproar and then after that he tried to install someone as the secretary of state to succeed him and the house approved it but then the senate i'm talking about the, the government here by the way not the u.s congress approved it but the Senate did not, and they still tried to swear him in. They continued to protest, they fought it, and they blocked it. And then she was sworn in. Kind of interesting. And then she's the she's governor now. But this is all the bay here. You can see this is where you would come in, passing by El Morro, if you came in. Pretty nice view, huh? Not too shabby. Obviously, Puerto Rico's got a huge connection to New York. We're going to talk about this a little later. Another thing to keep in mind is that Puerto Rico today is actually a commonwealth. That didn't happen until the mid 1900s. In fact, after the US took it over, it was pretty much a colony. In fact, the military stayed put here. The governors who oversaw the actual island and oversaw the colony were uh, Americans. They didn't even speak Spanish. They didn't care to learn the, even learn the language. So that's one of the reasons why the language has always been such a big point of uh, pride here. It's supposed to kind of, it's one of the things that they really focus on as being their, their heritage. In fact, the Puerto Rican flag itself uh, was outlawed at first, all the way up until the mid-1900s. It was outlawed under the, under the Americans as well as the Spanish. It's pretty nuts, your flag is outlawed. Well, you wonder when, why all the Puerto Ricans in New York wear their flags everywhere, that's probably why. Because they're so proud of it and they never were able to do that before. It's a big deal. It's something we take for granted. Another thing you kind of take for granted too is the fact that you have a country. The people here in Puerto Rico have a lot of pride. They have a lot of uh, history and culture, but they don't have a place to call their own which kind of challenges the whole idea of what a nation even is, which is pretty cool. You know, you have all these different uh, influences in music, literature, art, and uh, all of that without a homeland to call your own. It's like the oldest colony, really, in the world. Here you have the Paseo de la Princesa, which was built in 1853. This is kind of right outside the city wall, and it's a pretty cool little passageway with trees lining the way, a little fountain there. There's a really good place here called Señor Paleta, which sells really good, uh, a paleta is just a, a popsicle, and I ate there yesterday. My cameraman loves them. That's how I'm paying my cameraman, in paletas. That's how you pay all cameramen here in, in, uh, in Puerto Rico, you pay them in, uh, in paletas. So now we're walking down this, you can see this in front of me. You can see it's a pretty nice little walkway. We walk by Fortaleza. So La Fortaleza was finished in 1540, and it was done to supplement the fortifications they had to the north, which weren't enough. This is before El Morro was finished. Now, also in the mid-1900s, there was a shootout there in the 1950s 
when the Nationalist Party of Puerto Rico, which sought to become an uh, independent nation, uh, tried to basically kill the governor at the time, who was uh, Luis Munoz Marin. Uh, he, he actually lived up here. We're going to pass by his house here in a, in shortly. But the Nationalist Party uh, was very, 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 I guess, extremist. They, uh, they actually committed a terrorist act in New York City. They, they detonated a bomb at Francis Tavern in Lower Manhattan, which I've covered in past uh, episodes. I covered it in the uh, Lower Manhattan uh, episode. Uh, you want to check that out? Sick plug, baby. Hey, <laughs> come on. All right, we're going to walk. We're continuing to walk here, and we're going to head back in the town. We're actually outside of the gates uh, at this point. And like I was saying, they used to go around the entire island uh, until they've been opened up. They were opened up in the late 1800s by the Spanish. Now, it's also important to know what Puerto Rico is allowed to do as a commonwealth. They pretty much have, uh, not, not autonomous completely, but they're allowed to basically have their own Congress, their own governor. But at the end of the day, they're pretty much dependent on the United States for money. They're dependent on them for funding. Um, and it's kind of a weird little setup, and we'll talk about that as we go. Uh, but that wasn't always the case in the United States. In fact, when the United States took it over in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there were these cases in the early 1900s called the Insular Cases. These were Supreme Court cases where the United States decided what to do with this territory. Now, prior to this, the United States had a policy of taking a territory and basically putting it on a track to become a U.S. state. Examples of this include Alaska, uh, include Hawaii. With Puerto Rico, it was different because in these insular cases, a kind of a slight racism was revealed by the justices. In fact, one of the justices who wrote the opinions to one of those cases uh, was the same judge who wrote the opinion to Plessy versus Ferguson, which was the case that ruled uh, that you could have separate but equal uh, accommodations for black and white people. Uh, segregation, basically allowed segregation. So that's where we're coming from. Uh, and he actually even said this should only be a temporary solution of having this kind of middle ground. But that racism, that kind of uh, ethnocentrism was one of the reasons why it wasn't put on that track. So anyways, it's made a commonwealth, this kind of middle ground in the mid 1900s, because before that it was not. Now, like I said, they had governors put here, white dudes who didn't speak Spanish. Can you imagine that? They just put them here every single year. The guys just kind of hung out in their house, didn't give a crap about anything going on. And it was pretty much just used to make money for companies here. So I was telling you too, in the mid 1900s, you had this Operation Bootstrap that really kind of elevated Puerto Rico. It brought in tons and tons of manufacturing. Pharmaceuticals actually made their home here uh, as well. Problem was, uh, those things eventually went away. And now in the 1970s, there was another, other policies called Section 936. These were loopholes that allowed for basically uh, corporate uh, subsidies and tax breaks to allow more things to set up shop. And those were repealed and started to be repealed in the late 1990s, 1996, and they finished repealing them in 2006. And that's what sunk this economy even worse, bringing, uh, in addition to the, the Great Recession, they called it, starting in 2007, 2008. So all this time, too, Puerto Rico is taking out a ton of debt, basically just to operate as a, as a, as a you know, a state, whatever you want to call it. And it's paying its, its workers, it's paying for all of its public funds using debt, a lot and lot of debt. And this debt was basically securitized and being sold off as bonds, et cetera. And guess who invent, invested in those? American hedge funds, baby. These vulture funds would come in and basically buy up this debt and basically bank on it becoming worth crap. And that's exactly what happened. And then they tried to basically collect on this in 2016. It was a really big deal. Kind of sad too, because they're taking advantage of the situation here. Then in 2017, obviously, Hurricane Maria hit and the uh, Commonwealth has had a really hard time kind of bouncing back from this. It's very hilly here and very hot. I don't know if you can tell that I'm sweating real bad, baby. But it's interesting too, because I was talking about how this place has such a strong culture and such strong a sense of identity. And it really is a mix of different groups. Now you take in the, the Tainos, the Native Americans, you take in Africans who were brought over as slaves almost immediately after they came here. And then you have the white Spanish and it's all one large mix of people. Um, but you have influences from all those different uh, groups as well. You have obviously salsa music starting here. Salsa just means sauce, by the way, salsa. Um, but it's supposed to be like a pretty much a Puerto Rican invention, almost in Colombians as well. But it's a big mix of different, you know, the drums of the African, uh, the guitars and different beats. 
But you also... <laughs> Is that... <laughs> My cameraman got Senor Paleta and... Uh... Oh yeah, you can hear some music right here. Now, I'm not very good at dancing salsa. It's kind of embarrassing to be a Latino that can dance the salsa well. But the reason is because when my brother and sister started taking lessons, I was way too cool to do that, so I didn't. But damn shame. Just let that be a lesson. Don't ever be too cool for anything. So now we're walking back in town again, and we're gonna be walking by Calle de la Fortaleza, which leads up to La Fortaleza, which I was telling you about before, which is where the governor lives. You're gonna see a big Puerto Rican flag above it. Normally there are umbrellas that, that hang out up there. They little umbrellas. They're not up there now because of COVID. The reason I'm wearing my mask too is because the cops right now will stop you and tell you to put your mask on if you don't have it on. So sorry you can't see my sick beard. <laughs> you can see that down here. I'll show you guys a couple things here though. This is kind of the touristy street, like when the cruise ships and things stop here, all the tourists kind of just hang out on this street, La Calle La Fortaleza. You have restaurant Barra China, which I wanted to show you guys real quick. This is where they claim to have invented the piña colada. You can see they have a big plaque here. Pretty cool. I wanted to take you guys by this. And then off in the distance, you have the street that leads to the actual... So what happened was, by the way, this is an interesting story, the, the piña colada was actually supposedly invented here. And then there was a Hilton nearby, in San Juan as well, that then claims to really have invented it. They, however, publicized it and made it a thing and basically made themselves the inventors of the piña colada. And now everyone kind of accepts them as being it. In fact, in 2004, the government pretty much made a proclamation you can see that, that's Calle de Fortaleza leading down to the actual Fortaleza, which we were talking about earlier. All of, all of this whole town is pretty small, actually. You can walk it pretty easily. If you don't count all the sweat that you're gonna drip from walking in the heat. And like I was saying before, a lot of the culture here was influenced by the Americans. Uh, remember, the Americans took it over in the late 1800s. So they brought things over with them, like sports. In fact, that's one of the reasons why soccer isn't as big here as it is in other Latin American uh, countries or places because the Americans brought baseball with them. So baseball has always been huge here. In fact, you may have heard of some of the famous baseball players from, from here. The Alomar family, Roberto Clemente, who, by the way, died while delivering aid in an airplane. He has airplane went down in 1972 on its way to Nicaragua, which is where my parents are from. Ah, look at that. We can cut through here. Might get a little dark. But take it easy on me, all right? There's like lots of closures and things like that. I'm trying to figure it out. So now we're walking Calle de San Francisco, which will take us by the Plaza de Armas, which we're gonna be walking through in a second. This is named Calle de San Francisco because of St. Francis, which there's actually uh, a church we're gonna walk by a little later called St. Francis. So this is Plaza de Armas. It's like the, basically the plaza of the weapons and the arms, right? And this is where the actual city hall, La Alcaldía, is located. You're going to see it here to the left. It's also where there's a ton of pigeons, a ton of pigeons. So you'll see this plaza here to the right. You're going to see a little fountain with the different seasons represented around it. You have a statue here of Tite Guret Alonso, which is a very famous salsa composer. He actually composed over 2,000 songs. And now you have all the little pigeons over there, the little pidgeys, look at the pidgeys. You can see all the little pidgeys there on the ground. Tons of them, man, tons and tons of them. They're always here. And then you have that alcaldía there. That's the uh, uh, city hall. I'm right here, don't, don't worry. I'm not gonna leave you camera, camera person. Go this way. This is a really cool little store. And, uh, and like Culture Center, the Poets Passage. Poetry's always really been a huge thing here. So you have this little poetry cafe, little gifts and a coffee shop. Then of course you have signs of the American colonization, like marshals. From first-hand knowledge, I can tell you Latin Americans, we love our marshals. Growing up, that's where we always shopped. Nothing like a nice deal, baby. Doesn't matter where you are, I guess. But that, that being said, it'd be nicer to have local stores. Oh, we're gonna turn around, let's go this way. We're gonna go down Calle de San Francisco, continue down there. It's pretty quiet right now. One, we're here on a weekday right now, but also two, there's not a ton of tourists. Tourism has kind of become the dominant industry here. Now I was telling you about how uh, you had Operation Bootstrap bringing in lots of manufacturing, but that, event, that eventually kind of started to die down. 
They've tried everything to basically lure American money in. The Commonwealth of Puerto Rico was made very dependent on American money because it was created and turned into basically a cash crop economy. People were uh, dissuaded from basically making their own crops to live off of, etc. And instead, just going into cash crops. So the farmers were encouraged to just make one crop, whether it was coffee in the mid-1800s or sugar in the late 1800s. It was always importing its food, which is a problem. I was also talking to the woman, Norma, who we met. I hope we find her, actually. She's a pretty amazing person. But she was telling me, this is kind of the street where you, don't, you go if you don't want the tourist prices, the tourism prices, this guy is San Francisco. We're continuing down this way. You can see the flags above the street here. You can see the Cuban flag, you see the Puerto Rican flag. The reason the Puerto Rican flag looks so much like the Cuban flag is because they date back to Spanish colonization. In fact, the Puerto Rican flag dates back to a failed revolution. In 1868, there was a thing they called El Grito de Lares, which was a revolution, of, an attempted revolution to overthrow the Spanish that failed. And it was put down pretty violently. But afterwards, a group was, was founded that actually advocated for rights of the Puerto Ricans. Hey! <laughs> and they were the ones who came up with the, uh, the flag. That was also outlawed, by the way, under the Spanish and then the uh, Americans until the mid-1900s. Here you have a little taste of New York. I love New York. Awning, you can see it there to the right. Trying to help people come here. That's another interesting thing about Puerto Rico. They were having a huge popu- Oh, also have here, this is really sad. This is called La Bombonera. This was built and opened in the early 1900s, I believe, 1902. And it's a really good uh, little breakfast spot. They make Mallorcas, which is like this sweet bread. It's almost like this flaky, crusty bread. It's really good and they put eggs in it. It has tons of powdered sugar on it. But it's closed right now because of COVID. But I was talking about the New York, the New York connection. Here you can see the, the Taste New York, I Love New York. Now the reason, um, one of the things, the reason I brought it up is because they were having a huge population problem, a surplus of labor here in the mid 1900s. And one of the things they advocated for is getting rid of the surplus labor. It's kind of a racist thing too because they saw it as um, uneducated labor, cheap labor, so they pushed the people here to basically relocate to the United States, relocate to places like New York. But the problem was, in New York, they were going with the promise of manufacturing jobs, which didn't exist. The manufacturing jobs also were disappearing in New York in the mid-1900s. You've seen that in other videos. For example, like my Soho video, my Tribeca video. Sick plug, baby. Hey. Also, to my right, you have Mallorca. This place is called Cafeteria Mallorca. This place here is actually uh, really good. I actually ate here this morning. <laughs> Very nice. Good morning. Hey, how are you? Hey, Norma, how are you doing? We were just talking about you. I said, wow, man. That's Norma, I came really looking for you. Oh, is you, did you see the downpour? Remember yeah, it was thought, pouring. Man, hey, how are you? Yeah. What are you Yes, I am. We're actually doing the walk now. Yay. So we're going to do a walk, and I guess I'll come back if that's okay. I'm not doing anything. You'll be here? I'm, I'm, this is what I'm that's doing normal. Right now. What a small little world. I was talking about the Mallorca, the Cafeteria Mallorca, which I ate at before. They sell those Mallorcas, which I was telling you about. Mallorca is an island off of the coast of Spain, off the Mediterranean coast of Spain. Look at that. Here you have the, the church, Parroquia de San Francisco de Assis, St. Francis of Assisi. But in the church, actually, people are buried uh, in the walls. And one of the reasons they buried in the walls rather than in tombs is because they wanted to be closer to heaven, higher up. You gotta get cremated, baby. Forget about getting buried. What's that all about? But you can see all the colors here, very cool. You gotta get the colors. The colors are very important. You get them registered with the city. And then off in the distance, you see Castillo San Cristobal. So I was telling you too, there was a school there. I was telling you about the Nationalist Party, which is kind of interesting. That was started by a man named Pedro Aldizu Campos, uh, who's a very like, controversial figure because while he gave the uh, place, the, the, the uh, nation, if you will, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, <laughs> while he gave the Puerto Rican people a sense of identity and purpose, he also, you know, didn't dissuade people from being very violent and there was a big problem with that. So he's always been a very controversial figure. The Nationalist Party of Puerto Rico was actually viewed as like a terrorist organization for a very long time. Today, they actually have plebiscites. I think the last one was in 2016. And people here still kind of favor the Commonwealth status, but it's really between Commonwealth and statehood. It's no longer wanting to be its own country. It's a very small minority of people. This right here is Plaza de Colón. This is Christopher Columbus. 
Cristobal Colón. That's him right up there. He's the guy who came over in 1492, then in 1493 and bought Ponce de Leon with him. Spanish, he was hired by the Spanish Italian guy from Verona. I'm sorry, Genoa, sorry, Genovese. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. So here to the right you have San Juan Casino, which was finished in the early 1900s. Very beautiful uh, style of architecture, very colorful as well. But you might recognize it from the movie Assassins, starring Sylvester Stallone. Whoa, ever heard of him? He's not Puerto Rican or anything, but it's still kind of cool. But this used to be where the gate went up to of the city, and it was torn down in 1897 by the Spanish. Now we're walking up the hill. This is kind of the hard way to get up. It's a little tiring. Norm actually calls it Dum Dum Hill, because you're going to get exhausted walking in the heat here, but whatever. So here to the right, you're going to have it's the largest fortification in the New World, built by the Spanish, Castillo San Cristobal. It's actually like a national park. It's very cool, and you're going to have the famous garitas, which is what they're called, like the little turrets, sentries, posts. You have them all around the city, protecting the city. Hola. Let's cross. Puerto Rico shifted big time throughout the 1900s to basically an urban country. The people live in the cities now. Before the 1900s, they lived in, on farms. You see a really cool view here of the sea and the ocean. Pretty cool. But this wall goes around pretty much the entire city, except for what we just walked by. And then you can see off in the distance, you can see El Morro, which is where we started. Now there's a huge connection with mainland United States. It's funny because in the United States, they consider Puerto Rico to be another country, pretty much. If you remember when Sonia Sotomayor was Ooh. nominated to the Supreme Court, became the first uh, Latin American Supreme Court justice, everyone always talked of her as being a child of immigrants. They weren't immigrants, they were Americans. Puerto Ricans are Americans, they're citizens. Now keep in mind too, it's one of five territories that the United States still has. Guam, Samoa, North Mariana Islands, and uh, the Virgin Islands. Yeah, but you're automatically a citizen. That was part of the, the Jones Act, which was passed in 1917, which allowed for free travel for the Puerto Ricans. So it's pretty much a revolving door. That's actually one of the problems they're having here in Puerto Rico. People are just leaving, and not just workers, also the more uh, educated as well are leaving. But for that reason, in mainland United States, you have more Puerto Ricans than you do in the actual island of Puerto Rico, which is just a little over 3 million people. There's almost 5 million in the United States. There's almost 700,000 in New York City. There's over 300,000 in Orlando, Florida right now. Here down, down there you could see La Perla, which is a pretty cool little neighborhood. La Perla is uh, basically outside the city gates. Now back in the day, former slaves and Native Americans couldn't live inside city walls. So they started their own little uh, neighborhood down here. And there was also a slaughterhouse where the workers of the actual slaughterhouse would live as well. So La Perla is also famous for being the site of where they filmed the music video to Despacito, which is uh, one of the most successful Latin American songs of all time. Seven billion views on YouTube. That's kind of what I'm hoping to get on this video. So, uh, you know, share, subscribe, whatever you know. But the Despacito is a song that goes, uh, Despacito, quiero respirar tu cuello despacito. petito. I don't know the rest of the words, that's all I know. But I think we should just end down there. Let's do it, let's walk down. So we walked downstairs into La Perla, where we're gonna end the tour here in a second. But this was also considered the last line of defense for the actual um, colony, as well as, you know, the city of San Juan. Now it's kind of messed up. They put all the, basically the expendable people outside the walls, and this would, be, this would basically give the people inside the walls enough time to figure out what they needed to do, etc. But we're walking over to the Carmelo Anthony Court so Carmelo Anthony, uh, his dad is from La Perla, and he actually bought and created seven different courts uh, around uh, Puerto Rico because of, he obviously plays basketball as a former New York Nick. Huh? Look at the connection. It's a pretty cool court here. You know, I used to play basketball, no big deal. <sighs> yeah, I had a basketball, I'll show you. But, uh, but yeah, this is La Perla, really cool little neighborhood right outside of San Juan. It's not a very big, not a very big city. Uh, old Viejo San Juan, which is where we just were. Not a very big little area. But uh, you can see little chickens and stuff, little chickies. Um, it's a shame I love eating them uh, as much as I do, but there are a lot of chickens here. We did it in La Perla, in Viejo San Juan, Puerto Rico. 
Uh, I can go back and you know, speak to some people, voy a hablar en español porque bueno, hablo fluidamente, soy nicaragüense, ahí, ahí no les vale nada, pero bueno, ¿qué puedo hacer? Uh, I think one of the beautiful things about New York history is that it really passes through everywhere in the world in the last 400 years. Anything that's happened in the entire world passes through New York in some way, and the Puerto Rican diaspora is a part of that. Um, but that being said, I'm going to keep trying to make more videos outside of New York when I can afford them. I got some pretty good deals here on flights right now, uh, I used some points, all that stuff, and here I am. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to make a video for you guys because I love you. I love you. And uh, I'm going to go walk around the city, go enjoy the rest of the, the uh, island of Puerto Rico, which, by the way, used to be called Puerto Rico when it was actually with a P-O-R-T-O. -O. Uh, the Americans, when they first started colonizing it, just referred to it as Puerto Rico, but then they finally said, all right, fine, you can call it Puerto Rico. We'll go by Puerto Rico just to kind of, uh, you know, please you and your Spanish language. This weird, crazy Mexican you speak here, all right, we'll let you. Uh, but it's, it's interesting, Americans are actually a huge percentage, over 90% of the tourists that come into Puerto Rico are Americans, but I digress, <laughs> I could keep talking. Hopefully I'll make some more videos and uh, we can continue to learn about other places outside of New York. But that being said, please subscribe, please follow, please do all that stuff. I'll put all the information in the description and please subscribe to Patreon. That's what gonna, is going to allow me to do more videos and expand this channel. That's the idea. I'm going to be the next Anthony Bourdain, I guess. But uh, yeah, that being said, guys, thank you very much. Um, I don't know what to tell you except that this video is over, baby. See ya. Sick.